It was a cold, windy, overcast November practice day in Neyland Stadium at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. This man, Michael John O'Brien, has been the trainer for UT Vol athletic teams since 1938. His retirement date, December 31st, 1972. As a boy in Chattanooga, Mickey O'Brien wanted to be a doctor. In a candid interview with a concealed microphone and hidden camera, Mickey talked about that early ambition. Well, I did, but uh, of course that didn't materialize because it was back during the Depression. I, I just wasn't, any, wasn't too many people had anything in. And you found a great deal of satisfaction in all this. Thing. Oh, yeah, I am, yeah, sure. sure. I would, you know, I would think that associating with athletes coaches and this kind of type of people that are in this game probably would be one of, one of the greatest satisfaction anybody could get. Yeah, I've enjoyed it very much. Of course, it, you know, it, uh, experience, great experience. Of course, I like to work with, with kids. The kids will be the one I'll miss. Hey, how you doing? What, uh, Think it'll snow? <laughs> Let me, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Retired Alabama football coach Harold Red Drew coached at the University of Chattanooga when Mickey was a trainer there in the early 1930s. Well, Mickey, it's been a long, long time, but I'll tell you one thing. I expect uh, you've taken care of them like all the rest of them, and particularly when you were with our crowd at, uh, at Chattanooga because we was kind of young back in those days, you know, and uh, uh, taking care of a, a sick boy that's supposed to uh, play this week is a pretty important, pretty important thing. Of course, we had some of those old rowdy boys that uh, we had at Chattanooga there. You uh, didn't, uh, you didn't need to fix up them up very, very much because they were too tough to start with. <laughs> but uh, we had some great times uh, when you were there, and we had some, we had some good athletes too. Sandy Sandlin succeeded Mickey at the University of Chattanooga, now part of the UT system. I remember after Mickey had gone up to Knoxville there, and I was with the university here, of course. I went up to see Scrappy one day, and I says, uh, Scrappy, you know, it's Coach Moore. Yeah. And I says, uh, Coach, I don't have any tape remove anything. He said, use the same thing that Mickey used. I said, well, I don't know where, where it is. And he came down there and found it hit off there, and I used on this young man. Next day, the guy come down there, and his leg was all red and hot and burning up. And he said, what would you use on me? I says, I don't know. And, and about five minutes later, the painter said, you used my paint remover. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> and Scrappy thought he had to make his tape removed, his paint remover. It had tape on it. <laughs> I didn't want to hear that. Oh, I knew Mickey would blow up if he knew about that, but I never did tell that one, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, gee. Dr. Robert Brashear, longtime team physician for the Vols, remembers when Mickey arrived in Knoxville. Well, as I remember, this was a very handsome, young, uh, black-headed Irishman who uh, was highly recommended to uh, Coach Nealon and all of us. Having had uh, background experience in uh, high school and college athletics at the University of Chattanooga and also in professional baseball with uh, Scrappy Moore's uh, baseball team. And we found out immediately that he was capable and competent of uh, taking care of ath athletes and athletic injuries, diets, uh, well-informed and studied hard and improved himself from year to year as he went along. He, he finally became one of the outstanding trainers of the country and has really been uh, complimented by the greats. John Maurer came to Tennessee as head basketball coach a few months after Mickey's arrival. I came here in, in the fall of 38, in October, and Mickey came in the previous spring. And so I inherited a basketball team here from Blair Gullion, 
didn't know anybody hard, and coming in in October was a pretty big proposition. Those boys had lost a coach that they thought a lot of, and I was a stranger, and I was having a tough time making the adjustment to get acquainted with them. And if it hadn't been for Mickey, I don't know what I'd have done. He was a great man, and I had him all the time that I coached here in basketball. He worked real close with me. Took care of a lot of things that were difficult for a coach to handle, and, and handled them beautifully. And the relationship between me and the boys was helped a great bit by what he would do. I mean, he'd just hand your problem. He'd make them uh, see what your viewpoints were and tell you what's what. And, and just, well, I, I don't believe there's a better man in the country than Mickey O'Brien was as far as, as handling conditioning and handling your boys and working with you. He helped me tremendously. We had a real close relationship, a real wonderful one. The man who brought Mickey O'Brien to the University of Tennessee was the late General Robert R. Neelan. It was an association of friendship and mutual respect. He was or, a great uh, organizer, he was a great, a great psychologist, and a terrific work. He really worked. What's Bill's strength as a coach? What's well, his strong point? Maybe the, he's, been, he's been around and seen different, you know, right? of course, he's uh, he was with Army, he was in Oklahoma. He's smart, observant. I'll tell you one thing, he was a hell of a good coach. Well, of course, the trainer may be the most valuable guy to have around because uh, if you don't have your top players ready on Saturday, there's no way that you're going to win the big game. And, of course, I can't describe how much Mickey O'Brien has meant to our football program. Of course, I knew him when I came here as an assistant and and was the tr uh, our trainer when I was a player was Jim Goostry who trained under Mickey and he's uh, a legend in Tennessee football history. But I can't describe to you since I've been head coach how much Mickey O'Brien has meant to me personally and to the success of this football program because he's got an unlimited knowledge of the game, a great rapport with the players and uh, that little fine line of knowledge of knowing when the guy is hurt and he shouldn't be out there or just when he's got a little pain and maybe he can go ahead and be out there and so a guy like that is just uh, very hard to replace. Bill, you ever see X's and O's in Mickey's office? Well, I don't see too many X's and O's, but I see a lot of ankle joints and knee joints and all that kind of stuff and I know he's <laughs> he breaks them down just like we break down a football play and he knows what he's doing there. Uh, I think he'd probably like to suggest some X's and O's sometimes, but he never has. L.B. Farmer Johnson and George Caffigo served on the staff with Mickey. Mickey was one of the most conscientious people that uh, has ever been associated with the athletic program. And uh, he would even discuss personal problems with the players. He was very interested in their personal lives. And of course, he was more or less responsible for the conditioning of the athletes, and he stressed conditioning. And uh, one thing about Mickey, he would never permit a player that had an injury of any type to participate in practice or a game. So uh, I think his uh, conscientiousness about his uh, profession as a trainer makes him stand out above all other trainers that I, I've ever been associated with. George, uh, Mickey nursed you through a period when you bunged up a knee back when Tennessee was en route to an undefeated uh, season during your playing days. Uh, about your relationship uh, with Mickey, you recall anything, uh, any funny instances that happened back in those days? Yes, Bob, I do. As a, uh, several incidents that happened to me and a lot of the boys that, uh, that was on the team with me, and I know a couple of them right offhand. I know when they built the East uh, Stadium, uh, enlarged it, and they put the dormitory underneath it, uh, of course, we just moved in. They didn't have any windows, didn't have any doors. And then on the Friday night, Mickey would uh, be checking the athletes all the time, and then we would... Uh, uh, get some cigarettes and then we'd smoke them and leave smoke in one room and then we'd go run to another room and let Mickey keep smelling and we'd go from one floor to the other and Mickey was just tracking us like a bloodhound. And all the kids got a big kick out of that. But uh, the, the best one I've heard about Mickey, he was so scared one time that uh, when I got my knee hurt against Citadel in my senior year and uh, was getting ready to go to the Rose Bowl game 
and they told me I had to stay here. I couldn't go home for Christmas or anything, and, and Mickey couldn't go home either because he had to work on me, so he finagled it some way where uh, he could take me to Chattanooga. That way he'd get to go home. He asked me if I'd go to Chattanooga. And I said, sure. So uh, I went to Chattanooga and stayed with Dink Eldridge, who at that time was our manager, and, uh, and so stayed two or three days, and Mickey got to visit. And on the way home, Mickey picked me up, and uh, on the way back, he was uh, lighting a cigar with a cigarette lighter in his car, and we're just talking around there. And the first thing I know, he was, uh, he done run into somebody from the rear and then mashed up his car and the car in front of him and knocked me down in the floorboard and hurt my knee again. And he was scared to death. And we looked all over that car for the cigar and the cigarette lighter, and we never found either one of them. But he was really scared to death about what the general was going to say if he found out. Mickey belongs to the Elks Club. He spends time there with Jack Hubbs and Calvin Walter. Whenever the season's over, why, well, he always took a trip to Florida to fish. I think General Nalen gave him most of his fishing equipment, and he was very proud of that, and loved to saltwater fish and loved to eat fish, and was always asking any of the people that went fishing to be sure to bring him some back. One other thing there, Calvin, you might add, every time he'd go fishing, saltwater fishing he always brought a bunch of it back here to the elks club to put in the freezer and we'd have a fish fry downstairs on some uh, evening and he was free on and then we'd have a big platter of fish down there it was fish that he caught and he, he did himself proud bringing it bringing it around the club and letting the fella the fellas eat the fish with him mickey met mary after a basketball game in 1941 soon they were married one day each week is a day for Mickey and Mary at the Elks Club. It's been a tradition with him. I don't know how many years this has been going on, but I do know that she meets him down here on a Wednesday night for dinner. And they've got the same table in the dining room, which is back over in the corner. And uh, nobody bothers that table on Wednesday night because they figure Mickey's going to be here and they leave it open for Mickey and Mary. What? Well, he, he likes the Italian spaghetti. An Irishman and Italian spaghetti? Yes, he does. And Hungarian goulash and dishes like that. Does he cook? No, no, he doesn't. Not any. <laughs> you think Mary's looking forward to having you home more? Uh, that'd be hard to answer. Like the guy that... Uh, Kind of retired. What you gonna do? Well, wife. My wife said she she married me, but not for lunch. <laughs> I told Mary she wouldn't have to fix me lunch. In 1964, Mickey was inducted into the Helms Foundation Hall of Fame for his dedication and skill as an athletic trainer. Young men he helped remember, men such as Dr. Andy Kozar. And I remember uh, very uh, vividly that uh, we all looked up to Mickey and, and we appreciated what he had done for us uh, as a trainer and so forth. And I didn't get to visit with him as frequently as some of my uh, uh, colleagues as Herky Payne used to always be in the training room looking for some attention. But when I went in there, I was very seriously hurt many, many times. And I think the, the little story about uh, Mickey is that when we were having the celebration and planning it, uh, I asked Mickey, I said, why don't you uh, pick an all training room team? And I said, it'd be kind of funny, and I think the guys would really enjoy it. And uh, in all seriousness, he wouldn't even attempt it because he said that it would hurt some feelings, and he didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings and, you know, about making frequent visits to the training room because he took it very, very seriously. And uh, of recent times, I've had many, many contacts with Mickey as a professional person in the you know, area of sports medicine. And uh, all the people that know him that are in my business have all the respect in the world for the guy because he has the individual in mind first, the, the athlete, and he doesn't you know, jeopardize the man's health to try to win. In this real high-powered athletics world we live in right now, here's a man who's you know, kept his mind and, and really knows his business and he has really looked out for the individual player, and I think we all appreciate it, and I just want to add my congratulations, you know, to his uh, serving the university so well, and, and particularly all of us who are under his wing, so to speak. 
Andy, I'd like to ask you one question, which probably recalls, uh, brings back some painful memories. Your injury in the Florida game in 1952. Uh, what did Mickey O'Brien mean to you during those particularly tough days when you were hospitalized and when it really ended your athletic career? Well, I tell you, I, uh, it's something you don't forget, and, and it's not as painful now as it was then, I'm sure, and it's hard to remember that far back about the pain. But what you remember is the, is the, the actions of that particular man, because I remember vividly, and I could hear him right now today, that uh, he was getting me the very best medical help that he could get. I mean, he didn't act himself as a doctor. He knew his limitations. And I recall very uh, vividly being in the little hospital on the university here in the bed, and, and I heard him talking to the other doctors, do we need other people to refer? Because I did have some kidney uh, damage, and I had some other kinds of problems which are internal. That He knew he'd need different doctors to do that kind of work. And I, I think there were about five doctors who were looking at me on time, and I really appreciate his efforts in terms of bringing those people around because it really did a lot for me in terms of bringing me back to normal health, and uh, I appreciate it very much. A knee injury in 1959 cut short the promising career of sophomore football guard Jack Kyle. Well, Bob, my first uh, real experience uh, was during the first knee surgery, and uh, you get pretty depressed at, uh, at times through these things when uh, football means so much to you. And uh, Mickey told me that uh, I would probably never get to play again, but I wouldn't accept it. And after I got out of and got to working on my knee, my knee trying to rebuild it, uh, it was going real good. And then all of a sudden, the staph infection uh, flared up and right back in hospital for another surgery. And at the time, uh, the, they didn't know too much about this staph infection. And uh, Mickey would, every day would come by and keep encouraging me and he'd say, keep your head up, Tiger. And uh, as time went on, uh, I kept asking and asking and asking and uh, he's one day he came in and he said now Jack he says the main thing that we're concerned is is getting you well forget about football because football is a small part of your life and that was my first real encounter with Mickey and through the other surgeries uh, he's he was just like well, you'd say a brother. He was, he was out there with you all the time. Real concerned, and he's not only a tremendous trainer, but he is a tremendous person. And he's meant so much to so many uh, athletes that's been here at Tennessee through the years, and uh, he's going to be missed greatly. Since 1967, the Vol football player who best exemplifies the courage and determination to overcome physical obstacles receives the Mickey O'Brien Award. Tommy Bennett won it in 1971. Well, I'd say he's probably the main factor that kept me here at UT. Kept me well, man. He, uh, he meant a lot because uh, when I was a, a sophomore and dislocated my shoulder the first time, I was kind of really not wanting to play anymore and kind of afraid to get back out there and he told me that I'd have to you know and he helped me through the hard part and then when I dislocated again in the last game of the season he uh, he really meant a lot to me that at the time that everybody was at the bowl game and I had to uh, stay in the hospital he came to see me and he he took care of me along with TK wall and uh, then all through the next year when I was hurt with my back and so many other things that he's just been a really inspirational force and uh, I just hope that uh, I can do something for somebody one day that uh, will mean as much to them as he did to me. I know when, when I was a sophomore, that's when I was a rebellious kid there. He, uh, he'd tell me to stay in my room when I was hurt or something like this, and I'd kind of wander out and take my phone off the hook where he couldn't call me. And he'd come up there and check on me and be waiting on me when I got there. So everybody finds out when you come to UT that Mr. O'Brien means business, you know, and that you, you can uh, try to fool him a while, but he's, he's an old fox. He knows what's going on. During, during the course of the game, do you, do you actually follow the action, or are you so busy that, that you... No, really I try to follow the action on the, on the field and get a picture of, of 
the guy when he gets hit and whatnot. <clears throat> when the 11 men are out there, are you looking for signs that a, that a kid might might be hurt? Oh, yeah. You look at the guy when he gets hit and look at the, uh, I mean, the defensive back when he makes, you know, makes a tackle. Well, sometimes the view won't be as good. There'll be too many people in your way, but you can always ring up upstairs and ask about you know, if you don't get a good picture of it. You never did tell me what your biggest thrill was. Well, I, I've had quite a few. Of course, going to, you know, three bowl games, back to back, whenever I first was here, that was a you know, great thrill. Orange Bowl, Rose Bowl, Sugar Bowl. We were undefeated in those seasons. One of them, was undefeated and then scored on. 39. Ball Athletic Director Bob Woodruff has known Mickey for 35 years. Well, Bob, I think the uh, one of the greatest things about Mickey O'Brien, and, and I think Johnny Maurer will agree with me, and, and all players that have played here at Tennessee, had an old saying, you know, that they're either for us or against us. The loyalty, I think, of Mickey O'Brien, he's been on the eight head coaches in the last 35 years here. And I'll tell you what, he'll fight you or any of them uh, at any time, if it, anything against the volunteers. He's for Tennessee 1,000% all the time. And he's a, <clears throat> he believes in loyalty and he tried to teach that to all of us players and everybody that came in and out of that training room. Because you know, boys complain and they get the feeling sorry for themselves and so forth, but Mickey always tried to make them uh, really uh, be loyal to, loyal to the University of Tennessee. Bob, uh, in all your years here, uh, did you ever see uh, Mickey put those striped baseball pants in a washing machine? Have they ever been cleaned? <laughs> no, not uh, it's got a rule against that. <laughs> <laughs> Iowa State coach John Majors, a former Vol All America, spoke for the famous Tennessee Majors family. Mickey, you old rascal, you hell, I don't know whether you deserve that or not. No, you great yeah, I tell you what, I've never met a person and I thought that that we as a family, Bill and Bob and I and my dad and mother Thought more of than Mickey O'Brien. He's been a great deal to me and the entire Majors family. I hope he has many, many years of great fishing. He's a one tremendous guy. Tom Anderson, one of the most observant and prolific sports writers in the country, has followed Mickey's career since 1938. We asked Tom about Mickey's contribution to UT. Oh, I'd, I'd go beyond that on Mickey. He's a... Uh... Not long before him, a trainer was a glorified water boy. And at most schools, about, about all they did, you know, carry water out there and rub a muscle or two. But uh, after Mickey came in, he, he just revolutionized the whole trade. Made a lot of innovations that stuck. He's been a tremendous uh, asset to the training business. Anderson had a brief personal message for Mickey, and then an interesting afterthought. You've done a wonderful job, Mickey. You really have. One thing you don't hear too much about Mickey, but, but he is an excellent judge of football players. I used to get as much information as him for just from the coaches, about the possibilities, you know, of new players, and what they could do and what they couldn't do and things like that. Can judge of talent? Of talent, yeah. After they, after yeah. they were already on the hill? Yeah. Well, he, uh, Mickey recruited in person the, uh, the greatest potential athlete, or one of the greatest they've ever had over here. That was a guy named Tommy O'Brien, an Aniston boy. Uh, Alabama just about had him sold up and Neyland thought he'd he used a little psychology. He sent Mickey down there, says he might think you're an old cousin from Ireland or something, having the same name, and damn, he didn't come back with the kid. 
went down and sold himself to Mickey's, uh, to Tommy's parents. And uh, the guy was sensational as a freshman quarterback, but he went to pro ball. Among those who most appreciate Mickey are his protégés, the men who learned the profession from him. Jim Goostry at Alabama. Jim, I understand Mickey had a wit and a lot of funny things happened in Mickey O'Brien's life with the student trainers. Uh, what can you tell us about the guy? Well, Bob, <coughs> there, <coughs> there are a couple of things that I recall. First of all, I went to the University of Tennessee as a junior in college, transferred there from southwestern Memphis, and on the recommendation of my high school coach, Frank Dittmore, who played at Tennessee in the 30s, uh, Mickey gave me a job. I went there with the intent of being a bus driver, driving the boys back and forth to the practice field. And unbeknownst to Mickey, I couldn't drive, not even a car, a tractor, or anything. But I went on up there and accepted this job, hoping some way I could hang on at the University of Tennessee. And luckily for me, when uh, I walked in and met Mr. O'Brien for the first time, he had an opening in his athletic training department and never mentioned the bus driving. And as I wrote him in a letter recently, I think probably I'd be with a greyhound instead of with the University of Alabama had uh, I had to drive that bus. Tom Wall, the man who succeeds Mickey, has been at Mickey's side nearly seven years. Well, Bob, Mr. O'Brien has taught me the athletic training profession. Everything that I know about it, he's tried to relay to me uh, his knowledge of the business, his tricks of the trade, and uh, personalities and dealing with different people. And as I've told people before, Mr. O'Brien has been like a second father to me. Mickey O'Brien will be missed by those who knew him when he came and by those still here, such as quarterback Condridge Holloway. Well, I'll tell you, every time I've been in there, which had been too often, I don't believe it, he's always taking the best care of me, and I believe he does the same for everybody else. But one thing that, you know, every time I go in there, it's, we used to get to start talking about baseball, you know, because Mr. O'Brien was an old baseball fan himself. He's a real good baseball player, and he, he happened to play in a Rickwood Field in Birmingham where I played before, and we usually talk about that. He tells me how it was when he played, you know, and I, and which is mostly the same the way it is now, you know. We just, we usually get on the subject of baseball, which is something I like to talk about anyway, so. But he's always taking the best care of me, and anything I needed, he's tried to see that I got it. Has he ever given you a personal word of encouragement or, or any suggestions of uh, well, uh, guidance? Well, I'll tell you, uh, after an Alabama game, Mr. O'Brien was one of the, I guess one of the first people to come up and really talk to me about it. And it's, you know, it's, I guess that was a time when I kind of needed something. He, he came over and offered the services, which I really appreciate. In his quiet way, Mickey O'Brien, through the years, became almost as legendary in ball football history as the man who hired him. And like Bob Nealon, Mickey O'Brien's name will always be synonymous with UT athletics. His wife, Mary, perhaps said it best for all who know Mickey. Well, I think he's a wonderful guy.